Hey everybody, welcome to this free edition of our Trader User Group a Weekly Roundup for the trading week ending February 12th, 2021. I'm Preston Brent. Thanks for tuning in. Theme this week, actually this year, is going to be the year of the ox, the old Chinese astrology, I guess, um, which means slow and steady. Uh, so let's take a look at where we were this past week, where the market seemed to want to go after this week, after a really strong start to the month of uh, February, after about a little over a 5% pullback um, in the month of January. So let's just kind of see. If we take a look at it, uh, and we'll just start with the index performance here and how things are starting to shape up. Most of the major indexes here in the U.S. Um, had a um, – this is week number two of gains that we had after coming off of a dismal January. We reached record highs. Most of the markets closed near or at all-time highs this week, kind of helped by um, some of the rolling um, acceleration of the uh, COVID vaccines and some of the declining case trends. But just keep in mind the way they're tracking these case trends is just a mathematical uh, number. Um, they're doing that to kind of boost um, – the sentiment, I guess. They're changing how they count the number of COVID cases. So, But I guess if they can change the way they count inflation, they can do the same thing with COVID cases. <coughs> We're also seeing this past week a continuation. Mid and small cap um, stocks are building on their huge year-to-date gains. As you can see here, Russell is up year-to-date 13.73%. Everybody was in the green this week as well. Okay. Um, NASDAQ's up strong 9.37%. So we're getting a strong follow-through from last week. The Russell, though, really just really kicking it and just doing really well. We're also, which is kind of going underneath the uh, radar or surface level right now, we're getting next week we got 82 companies coming out, the S&P. <coughs> this prior week, we had so far we've had about 400 companies report. <laughs> and over 80% of them have topped their earnings estimates. Uh, hang on one minute, guys. I got to get a glass of water. I always forget that. So let me just um, let's just see here. What do we got to do here? Let me just let me just put it on mute. Get a glass of water. Sorry, guys, just needed to get that glass of water. I always forget. But if we're looking at the markets, uh, year-to-date, energy is still coming on very strong for the week, 4.32% for the year, 13.17 or 10%. Members, this Sunday, even though Monday is a holiday for U.S. markets, so it's a long holiday weekend. Members, we're going to have our weekly market watch this Sunday night. There's a couple of big macro themes starting to take uh, place for uh, 2021, and we definitely want to be playing them. So um, I'm going to cover that for you guys this Sunday evening. If you're not a member, I highly encourage you to come in and check us out. The worst performer for the week, um, even though it says XLE, it's utilities, it should be XLU, um, down 1.6%. For the uh, week, consumer staples bring it up to rear year to date, 7.37%. <clears throat> now, a lot of fixed income investors are uh, watching um, uh, the markets very closely. Okay, and if we look at this, and on the uh, fixed income, what's happening here is that everybody's watching CPI data for confirmation that inflation is going to begin to accelerate. I think it's going to stay low longer than people think but then when it starts it's going to start with an alacrity it's going to move pretty quick <clears throat> the um, we had a little bit of a down surprise um, downside um, push in yields midweek but yields increased again on friday as you can see the treasury 10 years at 1.20 percent the dividend yield in the s p is 1.49 percent uh, so you can see that the spread between the two is about 29 basis points. So it's getting tighter and tighter as money is um, uh, in competition for where money is going to go. It's still flowing into the interest rate markets um, still or into the equity market, sorry, uh, still because uh, yields are just so damn low. 
uh, we're going to see here. The other thing is that they're getting more vaccine doses going out into uh, the U.S. population, so markets are betting on a strong finish to 2021. CPI data remains unchanged, uh, below consensus estimate, uh, so that is also a good thing, all right? So that's kind of keeping yields from really going uh, batshit crazy, as I like to say. Now, if we take a look at U.S. Treasuries this past week, speaking at the New York Economic Club, uh, uh, Fed Chair Jerome Power Ranger, Boom Boom Powell, he basically said he intends to maintain interest rates near zero and continue with our 120 billion QE spending, 120 billion a month, amazing. 80 billion is going into treasuries, mostly on the front end side, um, and 40 billion going into the uh, mortgage-backed security side, keeping mortgage rates down. So it's still, you know, being a boon to the uh, um, housing industry. Uh, so it, it, you're going to see here, as you see the P.E. ratio, uh, forward P.E. ratio up there is 22.84. It is elevated, clearly elevated, but as I keep saying, very low interest rate supports a uh, high um, um, uh, P.E. ratio, right? As Because remember, um, <clears throat> low interest rates uh, as I say, justify higher uh, equity valuations because you know that it just it just lowers the discount rate that uh, investors are placing on future earnings, right? So uh, we're and this lower bond yield also continues to support um, the appeal of equity. So it's still pushing money into equities. Okay. The other thing that's really putting money into equities is if you take inflation into account, the real interest rates, not the nominal, but the real rates, are still negative. Because if you take the current 10-year um, and you subtract from it inflation, it puts us below zero. So money is still going into the markets. Uh, it's just there's nowhere else to go. Okay. Now, if we flip across the ocean and we take a look at what's going on over there, you can see all the world indexes this past week. Everything is in the green. The only one that just had a little bit of a hiccup this past week was the German DAX. We follow Germany because it's the largest uh, economic power in the uh, uh, ECB, the 19 countries that make that up. You're going to see it was only down five basis points, but year to date, everybody is strong. Look at the, uh, Hong Kong, the Hang Sen, up 10.81%, very strong for the year. Okay. Um, the other thing that, that uh, we're looking at here is that They've got a, a lot more shutdowns going across Europe than they do here in the U.S., so that may kind of temper some of their um, forecasts. In fact, the, the European uh, Commission came out and forecasted the Eurozone economy is going to grow at 3.8% this year, uh, which is a slight reduction from their prior um, uh, estimates. And their economy, just as a reminder, contracted 9.9% for 2020. Okay. That is uh, the UK economy, and that's the most since <laughs> they kept records in 1709. Really amazing, right? And Bank of England also uh, calls for sharp uh, economic contraction in, in Q1 of 2021. Um, so, but they're expecting a strong recovery coming out through the end of the year. And then, of course, we got China, which is doing very good. It's the only country last year that posted positive GDP numbers. Um, so, you know, the China market rallies, uh, they've got their Lunar New Year holiday. They're out for almost a week. Um, I wish we could get a week off for uh, holidays. I think the longest holiday we have is like a day and a half with um, Christmas and um, uh, a Christmas Eve kind of thing. But outside of that, they're going to be off for about a week. In fact, most markets across Asia were closed on Friday for their week-long holiday that kicks off officially February 12th, so it goes through um, most of next week. And then across China, their car industry is just huge. It's, it's, it's been going up for 10 straight months, uh, and we saw a 30% bump in car sales in January. Remember, China is making this decade-long push to convert from an export country to a consumer-driven model similar to the U.S. And they'll get there because China is just really pushing very hard. So we'll see how all of this stuff shakes out. But that's what's going on right now uh, at a high level. What I want to do is just kind of take you over to some of the charts. So let me just switch the screen here a bit. I'm going to move over. Uh, and I'm going to show you a four-hour chart, which is um, 
uh, kind of like my x-ray view of the daily chart. Uh, I like it very much for just kind of taking a look at near-term price action. So as you can see on the screen here that's popped up, this is the futures market, um, and it's the uh, four-hour uh, uh, bar chart of, of the e-mini futures. And you can see on this chart here that we closed Friday near all, all almost at all-time highs. Okay, I mean, it's just really amazing, the market action. Uh, you can see this air pocket down here sitting right around a 23% FIB node retracement from these all-time highs that were made here on Friday in the close. So um, I have been talking about in Q1 a pullback of 10 to 15%. With the momentum in the market, we may, I don't know if 10, 15% is more, um, is doable with this huge momentum. Remember, it takes a long time to slow momentum down in the markets. And we've just had a huge inflow, you know, to the tune of about $58 billion in global equity funds this past week. So uh, we're seeing more and more money coming in and chasing the markets, which is indicative of starting to find a peak. Now, we're not going to change polarity and move from a bull market to a bear market, but we are going to, you know, have a little bit of a pullback. And I have been forecasting 10 to 15 percent. I may drop it down to just 10 percent sometime in Q1. Uh, and with this momentum, we, we had a little over a 5.4 percent pullback in January. And I thought that was the beginning of it. Uh, but the market buyers just stepped in and just took it right up. And you can see here on this chart, if I just kind of highlight it right here, uh, that was a pullback. And we came down and we came very close to touching the 2021 lows, which were made on 4 January of this year, right at the beginning. And then we just shot straight up, right? I mean, just straight up like that. So what I did was I used that as a pivot low, and this is a pivot high. And here are the key uh, FIB retracements off these levels. And you can see that air pocket right there, which is kind of sitting on this technical indicator right here of 38.70. I do believe we're going to get that pullback, um, and I'm saying about a 10%. And, and if we were to just kind of look at this, let me just clean up the screen a little bit here and just kind of show you guys uh, what that would what that would look like on the chart. Uh, let me just get let me just erase my uh, drawings here and get my pen back so I can move this thing around. But if we just look at a a 10% pullback on here, let's just check it uh, and just kind of take us down. You'll see here a 10%. It really, let me, I need more space on here, don't I? Um, let's trade it like this and move it up. Uh, let's get that off the screen. So if we look at it again, a 10% pullback takes us down right about to uh, this key level right here, 3541, call it 3550, right? All my yellow dashed lines are key pivot point levels. Uh, technical indicators are solid lines, like the FIB node is a solid line. These big, large areas, you, you should always mark on your chart, which was the closing price of the prior year and the high and low for the current year. Those are things that just prices tend to, they're what I call rat brain moments. Uh, when, when, when markets move from being in the green to the red or from red into the green, it always makes a front page uh, news or the business journal of the day, the National Enquirer for the rat brain trader or the color by numbers USA today, but a 10% pullback takes us to this natural pivot point right here, uh, sitting around 3541, 3550 zone, right? Now, if we were to just move back um, to about a, similar to what we got in January, that put us just slightly below the 2020 closing price, we'd move slightly in the red. I do believe we should get at least um, uh, a 7%, 8% pullback which will, which means we're going to take out these 2021 lows that we made at the beginning of the year uh, and come a little bit lower. Now, when is this going to happen? I have told our members sometime in Q1. I can't really forecast it yet because we just got a lot of momentum coming in the markets. And as you guys know, especially some of you old time traders know, once momentum kicks into the market, it takes a while for that momentum to, to just bleed off. Okay. Uh, and the stronger the momentum, the longer it takes to bleed off. But this is kind of what I'm looking at right here. And you could just see the volume over price where you got the air pocket here. There's an air pocket here. And if I step back just a little bit more, and let's go all the way back to uh, uh, November when the, mar the big market move really started, uh, right about there. That's when the big move started. You can see these air pockets right here, 
um, uh, this level and this and this and this. Each each subsequent move higher has been met by smaller and smaller uh, volume at that price. Okay, so eventually it's going to dissipate and it's going to wear down and then it's going to come back. And you can see some of these air pockets here going back to the end of November around Thanksgiving time, U.S. holiday time, end of November. You can see these air pockets in these areas of volume support, uh, which line up with some of our low for the year. Uh, and then just areas like this. So I am that's what that is the call that I'm making uh, sometime uh, in Q1. So we're already halfway through. So that gives us about six weeks um, for for this move. Now, what is going to be the catalyst that moves it? It's hard to tell. Uh, we're going to be ending ending our Q4 earnings season shortly this week and the next, and then we're wrapping it up. And then it's going to go quiet again. And I think during that time, which would put us the end of February, first two weeks of March, is where I think we're going to have a little bit of a dip, okay? And that dip's going to take us, you know, anywhere from 5 to 10%. I, again, I had said 10 to 15, but I think it's going to take us down, you know. So we can see, we should see at least a 3,700 print, possibly a 3,600 print, which means that we're going to make new 2021 lows. But make, have some money on the sideline, guys, because then it's going to be buy that dip, just like in January. And then I think we're going to have a strong finish to the end of the year. That's the way the charts are showing right now, meaning we should run up to 41 to 4,300. Real strong finish. Okay, uh, It's just this first half of the year going into the summer that's going to be a little bit uh, tricky, uh, and we're looking at price. Now, what I'm going to do is shift my screen over again. Let me take you over to another chart. Let's just get us over here. Um, and what we're going to look at is the, um, and I'm just going to wait until it gets on the screen here, and I'm going to show you uh, NASDAQ. Uh, you're going to see NASDAQ futures. Uh, everybody is at near all-time highs. And you can see the NASDAQ futures here um, uh, really just <laughs> – uh, very strong, right? I mean, just real strong um, and doing well. Um, just, just. But this is not the strong one. If and if we look at the real strong one here, let's look at the Russell. If we take a look at the Russell, um, and we'll go look at Russell futures, okay? Um, and just looking at the Russell futures, uh, let me just find it on the screen here. I'm going to resort this so it puts Russell back towards the top. Uh, let's see, where are we here? Here we go, right here. So if we look at the Russell futures, again, uh, it made all-time highs uh, back in the middle of the week on Wednesday, but it is still very, very strong, okay? You can see, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, it is up uh, year-to-date a little over 13.7%. And again, everybody is going to pull back, but there is no divergence in the MACD, so that does suggest we want to buy the dip, even if that dip is 7%, 8%, 5%. You can see the dip in January for the rut. Uh, people came in and bought that thing. So um, we just got to take a look at it and and uh, be willing to uh, stay bullish and just take some cash and have some cash ready when we do get the next dip, which is going to be coming up shortly. If we look at the Vanguard All World Index, um, VEU, even globally, you can see here globally, we're, we're making a 2021 high price globally as well. All right, so this is Vanguard Equity Index, all, all world. Uh, so globally, we're seeing that expansion, uh, global growth. And the global growth story, with dips, you should be buying the dips. Okay, And, and for our members, I've had you guys buying pretty aggressively since early April uh, in 2020, after we got out of the pandemic three weeks in March, and then it kind of settled in the last week in March, it had you guys going long, following me, and we've done very well, all right? Uh, but we've had a strong run, and I do believe it's going to get tougher from here, And then, but we do want to take advantage of these dips. I think we're still overall for the year a bullish play, uh, but we just got to watch the dips, right, and then just pick them up on the dips. So if we come down here, we take a look at volatility in the VIX. <clears throat> you can see on the VIX, we finally had a print at the end of the week below 20. Now, granted, it was close. It's 19.97. Uh, but we've coming in here. We're testing these lows right here. If we can get below 20 uh, and then get back into the 15s again, 
because the VIX has maintained an abnormally high state of readiness to just bounce back up. So we're at this point here where it has traditionally moved back up pretty quickly, which would come along with the timing that I've said, because if we do get that 5 to 10% dip, you're going to see the VIX just jump right back up over 30 again. Now, if we look at the front month skew, uh, you can see in February and March, look, we're, look how deep we're in the green. That is a solid contango. So that just tells me that the markets are calming down going out February to March. And then if we look at April and May, uh, this skew, we're in the green here too. So the markets are starting to calm down. They remember, this was solid red as well as the February, March, and we, it was a backwardation term structure for volatility. But that's changed around, all right? And now we've gotten here. Now, the one interesting thing is in looking at volatility, we've, we've set a record now with volatility being over 20. It just broke it this past Friday, but we've had, um, I think since the VIX has been formed, We've never been over 20 for this period of time, okay? Um, so it's really, to me, amazing. And, of course, if we look at the bond market and interest rates and the credit markets, look at the bonds. Um, as I've been telling you guys, for those of you that have been taking some of the trades, anything over the 50 EMA, you need to be shorting bonds. I've been talking about that going all the way back to September of last year, and it's just turned out to be a good trade. Remember, in the futures market, it's $1,000 a point. So right over when I first started talking about it, it was around uh, 177, and now it's a 165 handle. That's 12 points. That's $12,000 per contract for those that have taken the trade. Some of our members have, and it done very well. Um, another way to trade it is TLT with puts, obviously. Uh, and if we look at the interest rate environment, you can see here the 10-year rate is continuing to run higher. Now, I do believe when we get that dip, um, in the next, uh, let's say, six weeks, sometime in Q1, we get that 5 to 10% pullback. You're going to see rates pull back. You're going to see bonds go higher. Don't use that as an opportunity to change polarity in your trade. You want to stay short bonds, long interest rates, essentially. But just use that as a time to reinstitute that trade or add to the trade, right? Um, because it's going to, you want to short any rise in, in, in bonds or any decline in interest rates longer term. I mean, that's just, it, to me, it's going to be a good macro trade for the year. Of course, if we look at currencies, it's doing exactly what I said it would do. Um, if we take a look at the euro right here with that pullback, again, we're longer term, we're bullish the euro, all right? Uh, macro wise, I believe the euro is going to get back up in this area here, the higher colored bar resistance zone around 126 and if you guys remember for the longest period of time going back to last september i said this is a low-hanging fruit trade take the trade to the bullish side you want to be long euro short dollar or short the dollar but most of you can't trade the dollar the easier way to do it is just go long the euro okay remember it's not the dollar index because are the dollar it's really the dollar index it goes where the other currencies go all right, it goes kind of the opposite. The euro represents about 57.6% of the dollar index. The yen is about 13.6, and the pound is almost 12% at 11.9%. So when you add those up, that's about 85% or so of the flow of the uh, dollar, right? The dollar index. That's why they call it the dollar index. Um, so this is the best way to play it. Or if you don't want to trade the uh, Forex or futures markets, you can do FXB, which is the British pound, um, FXE, which is the euro. And speaking of the British pound, I've been bullish this for quite some time, too. I said it's going to be choppy, but look at it. It's just going higher. It trends, guys. Uh, it's a trade you want to be in. It's going to run higher. Uh, in fact, my target for the British pound is going to be up around the mid-140s. Okay? Once, once we get COVID solved, and we will. Okay, it's going to be soft. Um, once you, because I think a lot of it's um, malarkey in my mind, uh, but <clears throat> once we get a lot of this stuff uh, resolved, then I think it's you're going to see the British pound going higher. You're going to see the euro going higher. You're going to see the dollar um, starting to level off and roll back over again. Okay, So these are just what I call low-hanging fruit trades. And then, of course, if we look at metals, you know, our metal of choice is copper, right? 
Uh, we've been long copper, taking profits and everything since early April. Some of our members took the copper futures trade, made a killing on copper futures. Uh, but the other easier trade for non-futures traders is Freeport Magmarin. And you can see that trend line, and now it's starting to get even steeper. Um, I think once we get that pullback, you definitely want to be a buyer by the dip. I think this thing is going to dip down when we have that dip, you know, sometime in the next six to eight weeks. That's what I'm looking at. Um, and if we get that five to 10 percent or maybe a little bit more, every all the good stocks are going to pull back. Use it to load up, guys, because 2021 is going to finish with a flourish. Right? It's going to be different in 2022, 2023. But for now, just hold your breath and play long. That's what you got to do. Any dip is a buying opportunity in my mind. Um, gold, not ready yet. Uh, I do believe with gold, you can see every time it attempts to uh, broach this this downsloping trend line, it gets pushed back. You know, if we blow it up, you can see uh, it just can't hold it. Um, it's it's trying to hold the 200 EMA. If it breaks down, this is my solid area of support. If that breaks, it's going to get ugly with gold. Silver, I like silver over gold. You can see silver has got a different mindset. I think gold is going to start to catch up a little bit to silver, um, uh, meaning I think longer term gold is going to move up, but you want to be in silver in the precious metal side. You know, the industrial metals, copper is where you want to be. It's the play. We look at oil. Well, guess what? I think oil is going to be kind of the play of the year for 2021. You want to be long oil. Um, along oil futures or oil companies. Um, as oil uh, demand is going to pick up and supply is going to be cut, that's just a classic case of elasticity of demand. You remember your old economics class in high school <laughs> that most of you don't? Well, you're going to see demand continue to pick up with the global economy picking up, and then you're going to see supply being cut more by all these green energy people. And you know, while we all support moving to better, cleaner energy, it's just not going to happen overnight. So you're going to see oil react bullishly to this. Okay. I mean, you can just see this move here. It's just amazing off of my solid lows down here. Uh, and there's just ways that we have this that I recommend our members play it. Same thing with um, gasoline. If we look at gasoline futures, well, I mean, look at it. You can just see off of the, um, uh, November lows. It's just straight up. Gasoline futures now closed Friday at 1.69 uh, per gallon. It's going to continue to go up from there. It's going to be over two, right? So gasoline futures, the way to trade gasoline futures is the ETF UGE uniform got Apple. Again, just a really strong move. Any pullback in the global economy, you're going to see a dip, but use the dips to buy. Okay. Uh, to me, that's just, and there's some oil energy and E and P companies, energy uh, exploration and production companies that I think are going to be good buys. Members, I'll go through that with you um, on our weekly market watch tomorrow evening. So just as a reminder, everybody, uh, for members, we got our weekly market watch tomorrow evening. Even though Monday is a holiday, U.S. markets will be closed all day. Uh, futures will probably open Sunday evening at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, New York City time, and then close on Monday at uh, 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard. Um, if you're not a member, I highly encourage you to come in. There's going to be a couple of macro themes um, that I highly recommend you learn how to trade. The other thing that we're doing every month is we're putting on uh, a key trade strategy that brings in money every month. Uh, it's got an 85% success ratio, and we know how to handle it in, in bullish and bearish markets. So if you want to learn that style, I highly encourage you to come in as well. It'll, you'll find that it'll cover your membership dues. All right, everybody, have a great weekend, members. I will see you this Sunday evening for our weekly market watch. Take care, folks. Ciao now.